This week, Joe DeSimone from Endgame joins, uh, joins us even for an interview and discussion on fileless attacks. The technical segment for this episode will be delivered by none other than Don Pazette from IT Pro TV on hardening software RNGs. In the security news, tomato plant security, Uber patches, Samba updates, dirty songs on the radio, Russians on Pornhub, Windows protocols are vulnerable, and perhaps the most insecure operating system on the planet. All that and more on this episode of Paul Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. you by gain control of cyber risk with tenable io the first vulnerability management platform built for today's elastic assets like cloud containers and web apps discover a fresh asset-based approach that prioritizes vulnerabilities while seamlessly integrating into your environment and improve roi with the first elastic licensing approach based on assets not ip addresses tenable io delivers the data and context you need to secure your elastic attack surface start your free tenable io trial today by visiting tenable.io the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security certification training and research. Visit SANS.org to explore their full curriculum and latest training offerings. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. Coming at you like 10 pounds of C4 in a hobo's knapsack. It's Paul. <laughs> I just, I'm so happy to be here this evening on Paul's Security Weekly with the fabulous Doug White. Who someone, um, uh, someone was telling me uh, it was like you, your lines, like everything you say in the show is like a sweep, like a potential sweeper or like audio <laughs> clip. Well, and that. the first words out of your mouth were exactly <laughs> that, Doug. <laughs> Hey, we're all about shock value here. It's, it's just like, you know, no content. Just keep them guessing. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a fun episode this evening. We've got a fantastic show for you. Carlos Perez is on the lines via Skype. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. Yes, uh, I'm sure you're happy about uh, some Windows vulnerabilities, which I'm hoping you read up on because I read the article kind of late in the day today. Because um, I was trying to do another project, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, yeah. Actually, I do want to talk about that. I don't know if you saw my tweet, Carlos and Doug, in my Facebook post, but I don't. I don't like to reach out to the audience and just ask them like <laughs> random questions like that, like every day. Like, hey, I'm researching this. Can you guys just like all give me feedback on this? Like, exactly. I try and reserve it for every once in a while, kind of thing. Yeah. And I was reading up on Ansible, Puppet. Chef and a lot of these other different mechanisms for mm -hmm. managing either cloud-based systems mm -hmm. or, or real systems. Right. And <clears throat> I wanted to hear from our audience about what everyone's using for managing systems. And I know, like, I have right now, <coughs> right now, <coughs> excuse me, 20 systems to be managed. And I'm going to have some help with that and all that stuff. But <coughs> I want to do technical things so I can share them on the show. And so some people are like, well, you know, just VI and SSH. I'm like, yes, I'm doing that now. It works. It's great. It's fun. But I want to learn something new yeah. in this process. And so 
I would say Ansible got the most votes so far. I'm watching. Uh, it's ahead. Yep. You'll be following the, these threads. Yeah. And um, I started playing around it <clears throat> today. I really like I mean, in a couple of hours. I played was around with to, Ansible? Yeah. I played okay. around with Ansible. Thank you. Uh, in a couple of hours, I was able to like read a bunch of documentation, read people's feedback about it, go start implementing it on some of my servers. Um, while we were like moving around in the, our little mm -hmm. server closet in there too, which slowed me down. That's how so easy. To, and then, like at the end of the day, like I had a script that I can go out and I could ping, you know, run the command to ping a bunch of servers right. with Ansible. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Like I like this. I like the Ansible's Python. Yep. Um, I like the um, the uh, configuration file. I like that it's not JSON. And I like when I looked at Puppet and our Chef, it was more like Ruby. Puppets, I, puppets all Ruby. Yeah, so yeah, and I liked that it's not Ruby, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, uh, Ruby's on. okay. I, it's okay. It, but I, if, it's, if you know Python and, and you're comfortable with Python, it was you more know, just Python that, like that gear shift is yes. always that sort of disconnect moment or, or yeah. cognitive dissonance or whatever. It's like going from one operating system to another. You're just like, right. I love mine. Don't Paul, you, you, used to, you used to code in Perl. I Come did. On. I know. Anything is an improvement. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And I do some coding in Ruby as well. And then I just, I, I really, I just liked Python. And yeah. that's, and that's kind of my thing. And our projects that we do here are largely, they're all written in Python for the most part. So um, that, that I do stick. I mean, I play around with other languages. Well, if you, if you fact, work, if you I, work, I, no, I go ahead. Chef is Python also, I believe. Uh, oh, is it? And salt. Salt, also, yeah. Oh, yeah. Chef and one. salt were not amongst the popular answers yeah. thus far. Yeah. It was well, by if, far if Ansible were, and Puppet if, if you, and then... Yeah, if, if you want a job at Google, salt will be the one that you want to learn. Salt is used heavily inside of Google. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I feel like it's kind of pick, like picking a CMS... Like, once it you is. pick it, you're kind of, like, stuck with it, right? Mm. Like, whether you're WordPress or Drupal. You better or like it because you're going to use it for a while and you yeah. get to live with it. Because yeah, migrating all... Well, I'm not sure how migration is. But, I mean, once you define all your configurations and stuff. I, th I so. think both of those are good management systems. I've, I've fooled yeah. with Puppet. Puppet was the one I used more because I had done more Ruby coding at mm -hmm. that time. But I also fooled around with Ansible because we, we had a whole pile of servers at one point And I was trying... I was And, I, and for me, it was just a pure learning exercise because I didn't really have to do it. I could just jump in there and right. do them all. Mm -hmm. But I... I I like the idea of being able to explore those things and tell and tell people about them. And when people ask me, they go, "What what should I do?" It's like, and Ansible is kind of a, a really solid one. And and yeah. I, I think that today that one seems to be popular. But I always tell people, if whatever you look at the config and you read you read the language and it's a language you like, yes, then really you're drawing. probably going to like that tool better because you're more comfortable with it. So if it's just all strange, then maybe find the absolute best one. But you right. know. I feel like I'm not going to have less servers either. Like I've just no. over the past never years, happens. I've just been no. accumulating more servers. Right. And so I'm like, now I really need to do some. Every time you try to consolidate servers, you just end up making more. So yes, you want yeah, to. That, yeah, because the problem with consolidation is that once you move into consolidation, you're also moving to virtualization. Mm -hmm. And now you're able to deploy servers so quickly, so easily, that it, you don't have control, uh, many times you don't have the controls. Yep. You just start deploying a new one, deploying a new one, deploying a new one, and all of a sudden now you have uh, VM creep where you have yep. just way too many VMs. That's just like the old. Oh, it's I, just I like used containers. Call it, I call it. I used to call it shell slop because it was like as the mainframe grew and we got more memory, we were able to create more and more and more shells. We had the same exact experience as everybody's having with VM now because it was so easy to just roll out more shells and more shells and more shells because we had so much memory. And the next thing you know, you have all these shells you need to manage, and right. it was the same exact problem you got with containers that you got you got with VMs or whatever. Right. And and now I have that same problem with VMs because I'm just as sloppy as everybody else. I did want to share that at the beginning of the show for our audience who largely follows us on social media and participated in that and I want to thank everyone for their mm -hmm. feedback and I'll keep you updated as to how things are going on that and look for some technical segments which is fun. I do want to mention IT Pro TV's uh, speaking of learning new stuff. Uh, IT Pro TV's courses now include computer hacking forensic investigator V9 Kali Linux CompTIA A+901 and accelerated CompTIA Security Plus. Premium annual memberships include all video content as well as access to virtual labs and Q&A forums. For a limited time get 30% off monthly membership for the life Lifetime of your active subscription by using the discount code SW30. I want to now introduce our special guest for this evening, which I'm, I'm, I'm kind of nervous because I know everyone at Endgame is watching and a lot of people are tweeting it out that we're doing the interview today with Joe DeSimone from Endgame. Joe, welcome to the show. 
Thank you. Great to be here. So, Joe, why don't you, uh, yeah, it's nice to have you. Um, Why don't you start by telling us uh, a little bit about your role today at Endgame and then talk about how you got your start in information security? Yeah, sure. Um, So here at Endgame, uh, I'm under our research and development group. And what I really like about Endgame um, compared to R&D and other companies is that we actually get to, like, uh, do the research and develop the code that goes pretty much directly into our product. Um, so I work on basically doing research for detection techniques and then building that into our security product. Um, and kind of where I came from before that was uh, DOD and uh, went to school at RIT. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. DOD. Yeah, the old DOD, you know. Hey, I, work, I work for DOD. I work for the Navy and, and, and DOD in Oak Ridge, Tennessee a long time ago. <laughs> um, so, uh, Joe, it says here in your bio that um, you've primarily been tracking uh, APTs, uh, as we call them. Uh, can you just talk briefly about that and talk about some of the trends you've seen over the past five years for targeted attacks? It's interesting. Actually, as I was looking at the stories for this week, like the security news, I'm like, there's such a huge difference between being specifically targeted and having a mobile app that lets you like buy botnets and stuff like that. Like it's so there's like and a lot in between, right? But there's yeah. a huge difference between targeted versus not targeted. Talk about what you've seen in the, in terms of targeted attacks. Um, yeah, there is definitely a difference. Um, I guess as far as trends go, um, I think things used to be really easy. So kind of when I started doing this, it was like sort of shooting fish in a barrel. They're really easy to track. They're really sloppy. Um, and I think the community really started to, to catch up. I mean, you would see like, you know, threat report after threat report um, coming out, like basically there was no group that was, you know, beyond the reach of getting um, basically, you know, all their their techniques and their malware um, being revealed. So they've had to kind of grow over the years and become more sophisticated and more stealthy. Um, so it's gotten, um, they're, you know, they're still there, they're still doing the same things, but it's been, um, we've had to it's not so much like shooting fish in a barrel anymore. You kind of have to dig a little bit uh, harder to track some of the adversaries now. Do you think that's a direct response to a lot of the threat analysis reports that have come out? Um, yeah, I think it is. I mean, you can tell, like, you know, when those reports drop, those actors kind of, um, some of them just pretty much will drop their toolkit and then they'll go quiet for a while and they're going to come back at some point, but they know at that point it's time to, to change up their TTPs. Um, change up their malware, change up their infrastructure. Now, that's not true for all. You can't really give a blanket statement for every actor. Some of them don't care. Like, oh, yeah, you caught me. So what? Like, mm. I don't care. I'm still going to do my thing. Um, but some do respond to that. You know, th- it's interesting, Joe. I was thinking about that when uh, it was this week that some, uh, some of the ransomware, I think it was the, the Petya, Petya, the original Petya, mm. had released the decryption key. And mm-hmm. we've covered stories like that in the past. I've always wondered why... You would give out your decryption key. Now, bear with me, Joe. My theory is they, the people who've fallen victim to it have bad security hygiene. By giving them the uh, decryption key, it lets them go back to working the way they were and still having that bad hygiene. If they didn't give them the encryption key, they might develop good hygiene and be immune to the next attack. So I don't know if there's a strategy there because you mentioned you know, threat actors that basically like drop their, their toolkit, go quiet, and go do something that's else. That's a darkly cynical point of view. But, do but you I, think that's I why? Yeah, it. so do you think that's why, Joe? So Doug agrees. Do you think that's why that they're giving the decryption key away? Uh, you know, that's a point I really had never considered. Um, it's always possible. I mean, I have no idea kind of what's in their mind, um, but it's certainly possible. Um, you know, they... There's, you know, they want to be able to get access and do the same sort of damage. Why not? Right. Um, my, my other thought on that was, was just that they got scared because there's so many angles pointing at them now, you know, as they become known, they may have just been literally dropping the gun out the window and saying, look, come on, let's just, let's call it a draw. We'll go away. If yeah. Do you think off. some of the, so your point is, I, I agree. Some of the investigations will kind of cease because the decryption key is out there, so uh, why is everyone well, going to go continue to reverse engineer and investigate a group if you just release Well, I mean, you know, if you, get the DO, if you get the DOD after you, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, if you got the army of, of five different nation states going, we're tired of you, 
you know, pretty shortly a hellfire bomb's coming down your chimney. We know where you are. And you go, you know, if I just drop the gun out the window, maybe they'll just let me crawl on out the back door and forget about the whole thing and we'll call it a day. And they got other things to worry about. So I, that was, I, I, I agree with your darkly cynical view. I like it. But I also think that sometimes because today there's so much focus on these groups by not just, you know, enterprise level entities but by nation state level entities going we're tired of this crap you know okay we're going to turn the DOD loose on you we're going to turn the Chinese DOD loose on you and maybe they said uh oh it's getting a little hot in here we're going to we're going to cash out and we'll do another one later yeah Joe so do you think the the detection technique I mean not just the level of effort but the techniques that we use to detect attackers today have improved in the past five years um yeah I mean I think they have I think really there was kind of this um you know, tendency to stick to IOCs um, because attackers were, you know, so willing to just reuse infrastructure and malware across victims. It was re really easy to say, hey, like I saw this malware here, you know, I can just share this out and other people are going to see that valuable. Now attackers know, like, you know, they have to keep their file names different. They have to change hashes. They have to use unique registry keys. And they're just going to be they're going to have a, a much more diverse footprint across victims. So you kind of have to change the way the game, the game, the game's changed a little bit. Mm. You have to change the way you're hunting for them to be more generic. I think that's an interesting point. I hadn't considered Joe is the, how attackers basically have to tune and change their toolkit dramatically in order to evade detection today. I, I feel like, you know, 10 years ago or, or more, um, we were reliant on traditional antivirus, and that was so easy to, to get around. They didn't really have to put a lot of investment in changing every single file signature, every callback, every every method. But now they kind of do, right? They have to really, in almost a containerized way, right? Like spin up an environment, use it for a certain period of time, and then spin it down, change a whole bunch of things, and spin it back up again. Is that is that kind of how they're operating today? So, like... Like I said before, like every APT is not going to behave the same. Um, I think there's kind of there's two approaches. If your tools get burned, you're either going to do one of two things. You're going to just drop it and walk away from those tools, or and normally you would do that if you care about like attribution. Like you don't want to link. Mm. You know, there's all this stuff out there about this new sexy piece of malware. Okay, I don't want to use that in my next target because it's going to be linked. So I'm going to walk away from it. But if you don't care about that, the second option is just to tweak it just enough to get by maybe a network signature, maybe a host based signature, and now you're right back in. So, like, what have you really lost in that case? And, mm. and do, you, do you think that some – I was I spent two days with, with a bunch of DOD-type people and city and state-type people, and I'll, I just kept hearing intelligence over and over. So many people were coming from the intelligence community. Do you think that they are doing a, a, more, a better job of, like, virtual profiling, these kind of things, so they are targeting these groups a little better than they used to? Mm. And because they have the resources, suddenly you've got – you know, the resources, the U.S. Army or whatever, and they're directing their intelligence collection on you rather than just, like, active. They're actually looking at profiling those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the intelligence community out there has a mission to, you know, understand what threats are attacking. Um, that hasn't really um, changed. That's been around for a while. But the importance of that because of, like, the attacks and how attackers have kind of pushed the boundaries of what's kind of, like, in-game has sort of evolved over that time it's just become more important i think yeah i mean i just i just some of it's based for me on like the words that i hear from those communities when i meet with them and these are the people that are in the city state federal kind of people and i you know i just i've just lately like in the last year started hearing so many times now it's like i was in intelligence i was in army intelligence i was in israeli intelligence and now i'm working in this you know threat assessment profiling type approach so maybe that driving some of it too i mean just there's a bigger profile from like these agencies and also I mean, I think we have to consider yeah. that there's more money in this industry. Right yeah. now, a lot of a lot of people are investing uh, quite a large amount of money into protecting their systems. We have people coming out out of the NSA, CIA, DOD, DIA, all of these agencies, and they're building their own startups. And now if you, you're in Maryland, you're going to find, you throw a rock, you're going to hit somebody from a security startup over there. <laughs> uh, right now, we, we have so many people out there working on this. Also, another thing that we're seeing is as defenders are maturing and are improving their techniques and their tools and seeing what works, what doesn't work, now we also have on the other side uh, our state actors, we have our malware groups <clears throat> that they're maturing also because now they're seeing, hey, 
it's no longer that I'm in the Ukraine and nobody's going to touch me. Now they're going to come in with rifles mm -hmm. and, and take me somewhere. And now we see even the U.S. doing apprehend, uh, apprehending criminals outside of, uh, of the U.S. itself and arresting people in Spain, in Portugal, and other countries and just going in and arresting them. So um, there are new treaties. We're working better together with other nations and... Uh, they have to change their profile. They have to, to mature and learn how to operate differently. And we're just weeding out the, the weak ones, and now we're being left with the strong ones. Hmm. Joe, when, when was there a big focus on uh, hunting or hunt teaming or threat hunting? Did you say, did you say when? Yeah, like when did when did that start, and why did that start? Speaking of detecting, you know, targeted attacks, like when do you see the evolution of that starting? Um, I think it's really been recent, as far as I've been exposed to that. I mean, in, it's been around in the government um, for a while, in the military for years, but it's really kind of started to trickle out like those methodologies to the private sector, and now become people have really kind of um, jumped onto that where. It used to be, you know, if you went back years in the private sector, it was all about, like, preventing breaches at all costs. Like, there cannot be breaches. Mm. I have to be fully secure. Where now it's like, you you know, you can't protect every single endpoint in your enterprise 100% of the time. So how quickly can you find a compromise and prevent actual damage and actual loss from occurring? Um, and I think it's, you know, it's a sound methodology. And I think, you know, that's why it's been um, becoming more popular recently in, like, the whole community. It's also contain it. Uh, a lot of mm -hmm. people prep their plans like, hey, I got detection and I'm going to open a ticket and the ticket's going to somebody that's going to look into it. And very few people actually are, are thinking about containment. Like, okay, all of a sudden we have one actor here. We got to operate quickly. We got to contain this system. We got to uh, you go over there and their operations is not set up for that. Uh, they don't. They don't know how to talk with the networking team. They don't know how to set up the echoes. They never practice it. They never consider that scenario. Uh, and we're moving from detection now to better tools for analysis. And I think one of the areas that many people are missing from their uh, plans is actually uh, actually containing, because attackers are learning to move faster once they compromise the host. Uh, it's interesting, Joe. When we talk about hunting, I, I think back to when I was at the university and like that's what we did <laughs> because we couldn't put a lot of those preventative measures in place and oftentimes whether it was a student or whether it was a department we had no control over their IT uh, or their personal computers that they brought with them and so the strategy even as far back as 2001 was mm -hmm. we were looking for indicators. We were, I mean, sometimes it was simple as, like, I'd scan the network for a particular port, and if it came back with a particular banner, that person was distributing wares on, on the network. Who are the top talkers? Um, looking at NetFlow and seeing who's connecting to what, and all of these different things that now I feel like are table stakes when it comes to endpoint, uh, when it comes, I'm sorry, to hunt teaming uh, or hunting. I think what has changed, though, is the ability to do that on the endpoint, which is, of course, where, where Endgame uh, specializes uh, today. Um, so, you know, over the evolution, I know I, I asked your coworker this, too. Um, why is it important to do this type of hunting on the endpoint itself? Yeah, and um, so at my previous job at the DoD, I was really like a network-based hunter, and it was very challenging for me. Like, I was, um, I did malware RE there, um, but really where I wanted to be was on the host. I mean, there's nothing wrong with network hunting. It's great. You have to be good at that too. But there's so much data on the endpoint of what actually is going on, like the actual root cause. Like you could see suspicious network traffic all day, mm. but that could be a ton of things. It's until you get onto the endpoint and look at that data where you can make your final determination like, hey, is this good or is this bad? Um, so just starting there or having like an insight into that is just super valuable. So, Joe, one of the things that actually you and I talked about at, at somewhat at length um, uh, in preparation for this segment was talking about fileless malware. And when I hear that term, or, you know, memory resident malware, I'm always like, there's a file written somewhere. 
Like, mm-hmm. At uh, some yeah. point, like how fileless could it be? In how and there are also different categories of fileless. Uh, so, Carlos, before you weigh in, I want yeah, Joe, yes. you know, take us through yeah. like the different areas of fileless and what it means to be truly fileless and fileless w- without really, you know, being fileless as well. Like, what are those different categories? Yeah, I think um, like the term fileless is kind of one of those like sexy marketing terms that uh, pe- it can, you know trigger some people, but it really is backed in like real things. And it's sort of an umbrella term that breaks down into two, compo- like two different types. I think one, when you think fileless, it could be like living off the land. So using scripts like PowerShell, using WScript, basically not writing out malware, or some people call them like non-malware attacks. Um, and then the second type is what you referred to as like the memory resident type. And this would be like, you know, memory injection, process hollowing, um, techniques like that where you're trying to – you have standard malware, but it's just not touching disk. But but like you said, if I still um, have time, uh, which is really important, it's very, very rare that you have a um, an attacker that's sophisticated enough to be truly, truly fileless. But it's very common, that, like a lot of – like, you know, malware, crimeware – um, APT groups, they'll, they'll have at least some part in their kill chain, like a fileless component or something you could call a fileless component. They'll use injection um, because it's useful, because it gets around, um, it helps them get their goal by getting around, you know, like an endpoint product or something or like uh, a defender. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. Like it's rare that you have a truly fileless, but it still helps to hunt in that area because you will, you get a lot of bang for your buck out of it. Mm. Now, yeah, at some point, awesome. they have to persist. At some point, you have to persist on the system. And if you want to persist on the system, you have to write to disk. Now, some people will argue, no, I'm writing in uh, WMI permanent event or I'm creating uh, something in the registry. Well, registry is still a file mm-hmm. and WMI is still a uh, .data file, so still a file. Uh, but at, at mm-hmm. some point, if you want, at least if you want to persist – Unless you're using a technique like uh, once that I heard called, which was the Hind of God, where only you persist in one system and all the other systems you actually inject into memory, you're still going to have one or two systems across that network where you're going to have to go to disk to maintain your foothold in that organization. I. I'm I'm with I'm with Joe in saying that I think some of it's just a sexy marketing term too because mm-hmm. I mean it depends on how you define a file. I mean, even if it's in memory only, it's still, you know, it's some kind of container that, that's sitting there running. So, yeah, maybe it was never a file in the system, so it was an inject, but it all depends on how you define a file. I mean, it's... <laughs> in my, in, to add on to that, Doug, my, my whole thing was, well, okay, so I'm, I'm in memory and I'm doing stuff. The actions that I'm taking, programs that I'm calling, are leaving log files somewhere yeah, exactly. as well so i'm not that kind of always didn't sit well with me when i th- heard the term fileless i'm like oh that means like i'm never touching well disk ever and i'm not directly as a result a log file is getting written and that is a file so i kind of um it I'm depends on the that. technique and the terry craft for, sure. for example let, let, let's say that i'm using powershell i launch powershell and the user is stupid enough to ha- have not upgraded to powershell four or five uh, so his login is very limited. The only thing he has is, hey, a PowerShell instance was created. Now He has Sysmon and he has a uh, with, uh, loading of modules and some other stuff. I can still download from the web into memory a DLL. I can use uh, reflection load assembly. Sysmon will not see that DLL being loaded and being injected into my process. And if I'm using the Windows APIs, Unless I touch an API that they have a consumer that that is actually going to write to the event log, they're not going to see me. So that boils down to tradecraft. Mm-hmm. What? H- how far do I want to take it? How much pain am I willing to endure to not be detected in this environment? Because we have to be honest. As soon as you start moving into the APIs and writing your own DLLs, injecting into memory and moving into that area, that is painful. You have mm-hmm. to write a lot of code complex code that you need to debug test to be able to remain as silent as possible and leave at at the least amount of uh what i call spore uh Hmm. in the network uh 
for, for people to detect it. And, and now, Joe, in, in practice of, and what you've experienced, like what lengths do people go through to be fileless uh, in, in the context of what Carlos was describing? Um, I mean, I, I think it depends on the actor. Like I said, like there's there's varying degrees. Like you could think of like the the Dooku 2 type actors, um, actually that uh, Carlos had kind of mentioned. That was like the I'm just going to live in memory and I'm not going to write anything per, to mm. um, persistent at all. Like I'm just going to use creds. I'm going to load on and stay in memory. Um, if a box goes down, wait for it to reboot, reinfect it at that point. Um, I think that's way, way the exception to the rule. I think mostly you see like phyllis type techniques um, used very commonly. Like you were talking about like the um, reflection load. Like that's a very common technique. It's great because you're not writing that payload to disk where, you know, an AV would be able to scan it. So in that way, you're evading the AV um, but you're not, you know, you're still affecting the disc usually in some ways, but as a hunter, you need to really understand what, like, how are the ways that I can evade like the traditional AV and the, you know, my traditional security stack, what are the ways the attackers are currently using and how do I hunt for those? How do I detect those? How do I kind of fill in the gaps? Hmm. So on the endpoint, what, what are some of those methods you can use to be able to detect something if it's not writing to disk. Mm -hmm. So um, Jared Atkinson and I did a talk at uh, the SANS Threat Hunting and IR uh, conference, basically kind of surveying some of the um, most common in-memory type techniques. And we talked about some ways to detect them. Jared actually wrote a PowerShell script called Get Injected Threads that you can just run. Um, and that'll actually look for um, certain types of injected code. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, think of like the classic shellcode injection, from like poison ivy or even reflective DL injection with meterpreter, you can very like, you know, within seconds basically find any of those threads that are injected into memory and their associated memory sections with that sort of technique. Um, when you think like volatility, um, their approach is sort of, you know, um, with malfine, like you can through you can look at all the sections in memory and kind of figure out, well, what doesn't map back to a file on disk? And I'm going to kind of inspect that more. Like if it has certain permissions, I'm going to inspect that more. And you can find things. I think the only problem with that for a hunting use case is it just doesn't scale well. And really, if you have thousands of endpoints, you want to be able to hunt for these things in seconds. And you want to be able to do it continuously. You, you don't want to do you know, a full memory capture of every endpoint. That would be a lot of data. If you have 100,000 endpoints, as some <laughs> organizations do, it would be a lot of data. <laughs> um, and I think there is you have to prep for it. A lot of people talk about hunting. Oh no, I need to hunt, and we want to learn to hunt. But at, at, uh, but very few people actually talk about the planning that you need to go in and prep work that you need to do first for hunting. Am I going to be using WMI for hunting? Okay, how am I going to set up the firewall rules, the ACLs to use WMI? No, I'm going to use PowerShell remoting. Okay, so now you need to enable a uh, service on all of the machines. You have to put controls into it. How are you going to do that and from what host is going to access that? Oh, I'm going to use logs. Okay, are you going to use web? Are you going to use an agent? How are you going to bring those logs somewhere for you to analyze and how it's going to differ from the regular SIM that people are using for operations to find errors in boxes? The, uh, a lot of people like to talk about hunting but forget about all of that prep work and they kind of hit that wall when they all of a sudden realize, oh, I need to run a command and get the output out of 1,000 hosts. Oh, and that output needs to be in a format that I can easily parse uh, so I can bring it over into Kibana or OMF, uh, OMS from Microsoft and into the cloud or business intelligence suite or something for me to parse all of those huge amounts of data. A lot of people forget about all of that planning that you need to do before uh, you actually start hunting. Absolutely. Um, so, Especially Joe, scale. What, Joe what, what else did you and Jared talk about in, in your SANS presentation? Those are some really, really cool things in there. Uh, so we talked about, you know, some of the most common techniques uh, that, you know, we're seeing malware authors use and, you know, anywhere from crimeware um, to nation states. But I think one of the, the key takeaways that we kind of talked about is that, you know, like I mentioned before, like a fully fileless technique is not, you know, super common, but it's very common that at some point 
throughout like the entire kill chain of an adversary, they're going to use one of those techniques. And if you're kind of watching for it, it's like a really low noise way to do your hunting, to do your detections. Um, but as far as like the techniques go, I think we talked about uh, reflective DLL. We talked about memory module. Um, memory module is sort of like reflective, um, but instead of like a self-mapping DLL, you basically have your loader uh, basically go out and touch another process and then basically plant that. It's sort of like calling load library, but instead of pointing to a file on disk where an AV could scan it, you just give it a buffer and then poof, mm. that, that DLL just basically appears in that process. Um, there's even some advanced stuff that came out. Um, one was a, a technique called gargoyle by a security researcher up in Sano or something. I, I don't remember his exact, how to pronounce his name. Um, he actually had some really cool research into uh, a technique where basically he had his, normally you, for a hunter, you would look for any active threads in the system, but he figured out a way to basically make his threads go dormant and basically mask them to look like they're completely benign and not doing anything, and then they would basically wake up, hey, do I have any work to do, and then go do this malicious routine. So we kind of talked about that. Um, we actually built a capability into our platform for being able to detect that sort of technique, which was pretty cool. Awesome. Um, Before you mentioned uh, <clears throat> Poison Ivy, do people still use Poison Ivy? Uh, probably not so much anymore. I think my pain, actually, through going and making that presentation, I couldn't get the damn thing to run on like a <laughs> recent version of Windows. Yeah, because it's pretty old code. And, it's very old. Yeah, actually, you got to go back to like an old school Windows XP VM just to get the thing to run. But it's, you know, everyone knows Poison Ivy. And my point was that this stuff isn't new. Like it's been around for over a decade. So like you might hear file in the news and you're just like, wait, what is this thing? It's been around for a while. But to be honest, like it's becoming more and more common. It's just so much easier for attackers to just go to GitHub and just pull down the code they need in order to be fileless. And now, you know, it doesn't take as much sophistication. And I think that was a big um, point that we wanted to, to raise. And that Poison Ivy worked well for that. I, I think some of that's just, a, I call that the script kitty ramp up problem. Mm -hmm. Because it's just any technique, no matter how sophisticated it is, when someone first invents it, then it, it, it gets hidden and they use it and they use it and they use it, but then somebody releases it and then it becomes on GitHub, GitHub mm -hmm. and people record you know information about it and you can find out how to do it. And even if it goes out of style, then the technique kind of remains. And so every time somebody comes up with a really new you know like injection technique or like using buffer injections and all these kind of things. Or even like using Docker. Is kind well, of, even yeah. using Docker, <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. Also, you have to think about deniability. If I'm using a technique that everybody's using out there, how are, how are you going to attribute that to me uh, in the case that I'm a, yeah. a, a, a state? For example, th that's one of the reasons that many people say or use the theory that the Chinese actually use a lot of or reuse a lot of malware uh, from other people. The thing is that so you cannot attribute it back to them. And if you look at the uh, documents that Snowden leaked, he, we actually see that the NSA actually repurposes uh, botnets and repurposes malware just because of that same principle. Hmm. So that that way attribution is all, all of a sudden muddied. Yeah, and, and there's and there's two parts of that. You don't get any credit, but you don't get any credit. So if you're the NSA, you don't want any credit, so why not? It's just hiding in plain sight. I'm going to use a technique that only this person always used, and now you know I'm, I look like that person. So, I, I mean, I can see both sides of that. Or or you're somebody who's a rogue who says, I want, I want that credit. I want to be known for that. But, yeah, I can see both pieces of it. Yeah, it, it, Joe, and in, in speaking of attribution, I'm on the very – really skeptical end of the attribution like i mm -hmm. even think we point at a group and say it's this country or even this group i'm like you don't it's computers and the internet you don't really know that right like yeah on the internet anyone can be a dog right remember that oh they're right. like one of the first cartoons <laughs> ever about the internet i don't know where you fall on the attribution uh side of things joe yeah i think um you know for any any company any private company like attribution is just going to be incredibly hard and i mean it's a fun exercise um you know it's it's useful to try to piece things together to kind of understand maybe why like kind of get in the attacker's head like why are they doing this what are they actually going after um what sort of geopolitical stuff could be affecting it but at the end of the day it doesn't matter who it is really i mean they're in your system they're trying to get your data you're going to respond the same way you're going to kick them out so 
I mean, yeah, it's fun to do the attribution thing, but at the end of the day, for like a practitioner, it just doesn't matter. I mean, that, that's a strategic issue too, though. I mean, I mean, if if you're a practitioner, you're a tactical level person who's just trying to keep the lights on. Yeah, but exactly. if you're a, if you're a strategic level person and you're saying we would really like to attribute this to North Korea, then all of a sudden it becomes a big issue. It also becomes like maybe I'll disguise myself as North Korea yeah. because I really want to look like North Korea because I'm a lot scarier if I do that than if I'm just some guy in you know in Colorado that that's attacking you. So. I, again, I can see both sides of it, and but it's I, I don't see how it's really totally possible to attribute to anyone because it's easy enough to disguise if you especially got resources. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. Anyone can be a dog <coughs> on the internet, or a sixteen-year-old girl, or anyone on the internet. And I mean, that's really the point, right? Exactly. Uh, it's like you're taking that tracking device and you're putting it on a random animal and letting them run around the internet with it, right? I know. I have a story about attribution in a physical sense oh. uh, later Sounds on. Sounds dirty. I, well, no, I had some... Every couple of years this happens in my neighborhood. They break into your car and they steal like whatever is yeah. of value. And they're not smart criminals at, at yeah, all. Yeah, because they're car breaking, yeah. It's a, they, but they're not even like breaking into the car. It's just whoever's car's unlocked. Well, they're no, taking no, it's like, and I'm like, well, what if I just tag... Like my thing is like maybe I'll get like an old cell phone yeah, and I'll put like a tracker tag on it and put a case on it and I'll just leave that in my car yeah. at all times so that if someone does take it yeah, at least grab that. I want attribution I want to know who that is right. but is it really and we have the same problem on the internet is it really the same person that's going to break into your computer system or break into your, your car <laughs> right it's you, not you, yeah. and so I guess like how much effort do we put into that I think better to put effort into protecting yourself I, like I completely making agree. sure you lock your car and not don't leave your valuables in it or in but at the case, same time the, the strategic level po politicizing of it means resources and money and so forth and if you're playing these right. nation state games and you're the army or you're the air force or whoever you are they do need to make those attributions because that's how they get resources to do the to do the tactical level stuff. Mm -hmm. Because if they can't convince the politicians who control the money that this is a threat from a nation state, yeah. or it's really just some guy named Larry in in Poughkeepsie, New York, there's a real difference in how much budget you get for that. <coughs> but Jim, did you focus more on the the protection and detection aspect and less on the attribution for that reason? Is it kind of a, a not a waste of resources, but not the best usage of people's resources? So, I mean, it's kind of different. Like when I started my career in like working for the DOD doing intelligence, it was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, and that, that was the government part of it where that mattered more. But in the private sector, it just it doesn't matter as much. I mean, um, and, and the funny thing is, like the techniques that like the advanced adversaries use, like the nation state adversaries use are really most of them are the same techniques that like the criminal yep. You know the fin sevens, the fin eights of the world are using it. You know, everyone's using the same type of techniques. You know, they're reading the same blogs that we are, the same red team blogs that we are, and we're using stuff. Um, so I, I totally get what you're saying, uh, Doug, about um, it mattering for resources and mattering for government. But I do think that it just it's not as big of a deal for um, a commercial company. No, I, I, com I completely agree with that statement. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, they have no interest in it. I uh, completely agree. Um. Joe, is there anything else you want to talk about in terms of uh, fileless malware or uh, some of the stuff you're working on at Endgame? Yeah, I mean, um, I really just kind of want to let people know sort of about fileless malware and about hunting for it because, um, like I said, it's it's pretty common technique that adversaries are using, those you know type of fileless techniques. And just to make sure, like, you know, talk to the people – um, your security stack provider, like your endpoint vendors, um, kind of get smart on it as best as you can and poke them and prod them and see, you know, like test their stuff against it. Like, you know, go get Meterpreter, load that up, see how they would do against that. Go, you know, play around with PowerShell Empire. It, you know, it takes seconds to set up, like play around with that and see how your endpoint security vendor does. Um, that's the best way to be able to understand, like, you know, realistically, am I going to be able to detect, this sort of adversarial activity. Um, and I understand it's really hard for people that don't really have the resources to be able to do that. Um, but you know, when you're doing like a POC process with a whole bunch of vendors, like, you know, bring that up, like those sort of techniques. And, you know, if they really know what they're doing, they'll walk you through like, you know, real world scenarios of in the wild sort of techniques. And, uh, you, you know, you can't 100% trust what a vendor is saying, like take everything with a grain of salt. But, um, 
I think that you should be wary of the techniques that are out there and, um, you know, make sure that you, you think you, at least to the best of your ability and the best is the money and resource you have available in your department, that you have those things covered. Joe, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? I am ready. I'll go for it. Three words to describe yourself. All right. Uh, motivated, uh, nerdy, and competitive. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Got to go with the icicle. Got classic icicle, man. Got to. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? The Social Introvert. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I'm a second guy. Choose two <laughs> celebrities to be your parents. Uh, so I'm going to go with... Superman and Daenerys Targaryen. Very wow. nice. Very nice. I think you prepped yourself for those questions, Joe, would be my estimation. Always be prepared. I was watching prepared. Paul, so I, I yeah. heard the questions. So you had time to Paul prep. Week. That's good. Well, Joe, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. It was wonderful having you tell everyone at Endgame we said hello. Uh, they're listening now. Hello. Hello, Endgame. Thank you for watching, uh, and thank you for coming on the show, Joe. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And with that, we will take a short break. Come back. Bring on Don Pazette from IT Pro TV. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>